Some sermons are sermons of advocacy, and some sermons are sermons of storytelling, and others are sermons of mystery. Well, this Sunday I think I need to preach a sermon of reminding. It seems that reminding is one of the things that we do when we gather together to hear the Jesus story, to sing the songs, and to celebrate the sacraments. We need to be reminded of who we are and who we are called to be. It's funny that even the philosopher and atheist Alain de Botton, when he speaks of the benefits, the uses of religion, even to those who are atheists, he says, you know, to come back week after week in fellowship and be reminded of what's important in life is one of the great uses of religion, one of its great purposes. And so, may this be a reminding sermon. Jesus said, you, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. This is not a compliment. This is an image of our identity. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. To be said not by someone who cannot take you any further than repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. No, Jesus says you are the light of the world because he who says repent for the kingdom of God is near. He also says you are the light of the world. You not only are called to repent of everything that stands in the way of your relationship with God, you, as you are, are to be the light of the world. Jesus, of course, in that beautiful hill country of Galilee, uses images from the countryside, images that are meant to be understood by everyone in the home, in the village, in the field. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. Not the salt of the sea, mind you, the salt of the earth. Those crusts of salt deposits that sort of pop up in the edges of the hills, where you can sort of pick out a bit. That kind of salt. But you know, the funny thing about that kind of salt is that as the sun acts on it, as the moisture acts on it, the saltiness leaches away, and all you're left with is some grit and other minerals. So yes, that's what he means by salt losing its taste. If you scrape out deep enough in the side of some little salt deposit in the hill, you can pick out salty salt. And if it's been there eroding, dying off, well, you can't really get salty salt. That's what he means when he says you're the salt of the earth. Do you know sometimes the kingdom of God can so possess you as a dream of God, yet over time, lose its flavor in our lives. Think about the mission of the Christian church, whether it is the global Christian church or whether it is the church manifested in neighborhoods, communities like this. We have to always watch if we lost our saltiness, if we lost the flavor of the gospel. Has it died away from us? Have we lost something over time? Over time, we have to ask ourselves, have we lost a sense of mission and a sense of purpose? Sometimes you have to ask that in yourself. Sometimes just a quiet moment, maybe even a quiet season of life, we really spend some time in prayer, in attention to the Word of God, in deep conversation with fellow Christians, ask yourself, have I lost something? Have I lost some sense of direction and mission? Have I lost some sense of hopefulness in what the Church of Jesus Christ can be? All too often in my Facebook feed, I'll get commentary from some of my church nerd friends and my clergy colleagues, and they're sharing things about the life of the church and how it can be more alive and what's wrong with this church's generation and blah, 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 and it goes on and on. And I can read that, and I can wonder if we lost something. I can look at our own 
concerns even in our own congregation. Is the budget going to be filled out with pledges? Do we have what it takes to keep our congregation going? I look at today and I'm like, oh, I wish there were more people here today. I'm glad you're all here. But I wonder, have we lost a bit of something? Have we lost some of that flavor that perhaps we had a year, five years, ten years ago? Did we lose some of the flavor in our souls when we stopped believing in Santa Claus and thought God was supposed to go out with that? <coughs> you are the salt of the earth, Jesus says. There's something about your flavor which is so important and makes the enjoyment of Yet it can leach away, disappear. You are the light of the world, Jesus says. He looks at people in the crowds. I was trying to imagine him saying this to everybody. Jesus broadcasts this image. You are the light of the world to anyone who is listening. Jesus teaching in the countryside. Jesus gathering a crowd in a village. You are the light of the world. I said it's not really a compliment. But sometimes I wonder if I know what it's like to be the light of the world. If I know what it means to have someone see that in me. I can see it in other people. I can see it in other people. I can turn to someone who is generous and compassionate and giving of themselves. Maybe not perfectly so, but trying. And I can say, oh yes, that person is the light of the world. Someone who gives of their time sacrificially to the needs of others. Someone who puts up with someone who is lacking in maturity. Oh, yes, you are the light. Somebody who is brave in the face of ignorance or racism or classism, bigotry. Someone who is outspoken in those cases. That's the person who is in is the light of the world. I think to myself, you know, last Sunday we celebrated the feast of the presentation of Jesus in the temple, but actually, for the fourth Sunday of the Epiphany, if nothing else had been going on, we would have been hearing the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes of Jesus as he teaches them in Matthew's Gospel. I'm going to read just a bit of this to refresh your mind. These are people who are the light of the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are Mourning, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they are going to see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they are going to be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, light of the world. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil and slander against you falsely on account of my name. Rejoice and be glad, Jesus says, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before. You, the light of the world. You, the salt of the earth. That's the kind of light we are called to be. The blessed light that Jesus describes. And Jesus says, don't hide it. Don't hide it because in face of this world and all of its corruption and all of its violence and all of its lusting after power, don't hide it, Jesus says. It's needed to be seen. Don't be humble about it. Be brave to show your life. You know, we've got the Olympics going on now in Sochi, Russia. And I know a number of my friends have been deeply concerned about the effects of profound bigotry that is written into the laws of Russia now against gay folks and lesbian folks. I've shared some of them on my Facebook feed. It's terrible. I think to myself, my God, it's like this is a life I couldn't possibly have with my partner and four boys. To go to Russia, to even think of traveling to Russia. Good Lord. The treatment, the abuse that folks get simply to be who they are. 
and that there is just a general cultural spirit in Rush that is perfectly happy to place all of its animus and frustration against the other, against gay folks. But when I see this sense of folks who are willing to be who they are, gay folks, and even their straight allies in Russia, I see that they are indeed called to be the light of the world. And I ask myself, could I be that kind of light? Would I chicken out? What would my life be like? Would I even be alive? Don't hide your light, Jesus says. Don't hide it anywhere you go. I think to myself, there are so many instances every day where any of us could be light, where there is darkness, where there is obscurity, where there is a desire to simply manipulate by others. And none of us are ever going to get this right. None of us are ever going to do this perfectly, being the light of the world. None of us. It's a strange thing when Paul speaks about the church in Corinth, the perfect example of a messed up church. A church that has been shaped by Paul's teaching. A church that is really, you know, facing a pagan culture that surrounds it. Paul says, you know, that's just not the world we Christians are called to participate in. That world that surrounds us, which we call the real world, that world is not the world you participate in, Paul says to the church in Corinth, because you're going to participate in the world that God shares with you. Now, of course, the church in Corinth was one of those churches, I guess, that's just like almost any other church, just like any other human community. There were those who thought they were much better, much more enlightened than others. There were those who were the newbies who came in and ruined it all with their way of messing things up. There were so many different ways of understanding what it meant to do Christianity right. Paul, in his letter to Corinth, tries to address this carefully and thoughtfully and lovingly. <coughs> lovingly. And yet he can imagine that this is a church that can lose that light. It's almost on the verge of it. So if I ever think, oh my God, the church has so many problems, the worldwide church has so many problems, the church in Logan Square has so many problems, I go back to Paul's first letter church in Corinth. It's that big of a mess. It's the perfect mess. And you wonder to yourself, wow, if human beings can be like that in a messed up church, if human beings can be like that in a messed up world, it's hard to be the light. It's hard to be the light. But we must be the light, nonetheless. You know, when Jesus says, I came not to abolish the law and the prophets, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He is speaking in a way which, you know, I think we've interpreted way through, way too much through sort of the Protestant Reformation's theologies. But if we understand how Jews understood the law, the Torah, perhaps we can appreciate it a little. For the law of the prophets, the Torah of God, was given as a gift to the Jewish people as a sign of their wholehearted connection with God. God says, I want a covenant with you, O people of Israel. I want a covenant with you, a life with you. Let me tell you what that life looks like. So if we can respect that for what it is, we can have some appreciation that the Torah which some rabbis have said was created before the worlds began and was in God's mind to give this Torah to his chosen people. This same law, this same law, is to be a sign of wholeness with God's people. Well now as Jesus talks about fulfilling the law and not abolishing it, he envisions a gospel vision of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It's not about the afterlife, it's about our life. And 
in this life we participate in, we are called to wholeness, just as the Torah called the people of Israel to, to wholeness with God. And so when Jesus says, you know, not one stroke of a letter is going to be wiped away from this, he is talking about the spirit of the law that gives us wholehearted permission to join our lives to God. Wholehearted permission to join our lives to God. How often do we feel that we need permission to dive into the gospel life? It's the voice of the Spirit say, come on, get in there. Be the light of the world. Be the salt of the earth. Don't lose this great gift which the Spirit of God is giving to you. Don't lose that gift. That's my reminder to you this week. Don't lose these gifts. They can fade. There is always the possibility that, yes, you can lose the saltiness of the gospel. Yes, you can try and put a bushel basket over the light of the gospel in your life. Don't do it. Just for this week, think of the ways that the gospel is hidden. Think of the ways that perhaps the gospel has lost some of its flavor in just your life and in the life of this community. And again, let's turn back to that God who honors us with his grace and makes our lives honorable for his sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.